Hey people, Duncan here. Let's talk about the opiate trade, the opiate cartels here in uh, America, how it started, how it got here. Let's talk about opium here in the States. So let's, first and foremost though, please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, comment in the box below, hit the bell for notifications. And with that being said, let's talk about this opium trade here and how did it start okay uh so let's do this watch this and we'll comment on this video the international drug trade began in 1606 when queen elizabeth i filled england's well by trafficking illegal opium from india to china British East India Shipping Company and profited handsomely, not just from drug trafficking, but from trafficking African slaves with her slave trader, John Hawkins. First, knighted her slave trader with the noble title of Sir John Hawkins. By 1830, the British had distanced themselves from dope dealing by granting opium monopoly rights to the Jewish Sassoon family who became known as the Rothschilds of the Far East. As an agent for the Crown, David Sassoon shared his dope profits with Queen Victoria. The British East India Company built a major factory to process the opium here at Gazapur. It's still a lucrative owner for the Indian government, which sells opiates to the world's pharmaceutical industry. When the Chinese banned opium and destroyed 600 chest loads of the addictive drug, Sassoon and the British retaliated. It was a financial disaster for the British. With huge profits at stake, they retaliated with the Opium Wars of 1843 and 1858. Forces of the market were to defeat China's moral prohibition. So see, they went to war because China was trying to ban heroin, opium. And the British decided that they couldn't allow this because the British were making a ton of money off the opium trades. So essentially, they went to war to go to, to, to fight for opium. Um, now this has pushed much of the drug all over the world, the different countries, the different continents, which essentially led it to America through the trade, uh, through the slave trades and through war and stuff. So let's talk, okay, so let's talk about how it gets here. Sassoon and the British forced drug addiction onto an entire nation stole the island of Hong Kong and made Hong Kong the capital of the British international drug trade. In 1872, Queen Victoria knighted David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, who spread the illegal opium trade throughout China and Japan. In 1887, Sir Albert Sassoon married Aline Carolyn Rothschild and joined the pirated fortunes of the Sassoon drug cartel with the Rothschild money cartel. Today, it's business as usual for the descendants of the Sassoon and Rothschild families who socialize with Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles as elite members of Britain's inner power circle. Many have been granted royal titles, like Sir, Countess, Baron, and Marquis, but their many victims aren't fooled by the crowns, the titles, and the tuxedos. They have very different titles for them. Titles like liars, thieves, dope dealers, and mass murderers. On the other side of the Atlantic, a member of the same opium smuggling syndicate, Samuel Russell, founded Yale University's Skull and Bones Brotherhood with drug money. Exclusive members were financed into political power positions in the CIA, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the White House. When Skull and Bonesman George Bush Sr. became CIA director, 
In the 1980s, the CIA recruited Osama bin Laden to train al-Qaeda and Mujahideen fighters. Okay, now think about that for a second. <laughs> the Skull and Bones, the one organization, the one secret society that has essentially trained and created each business person, lawyer, judge, politician, since before America was essentially America, is now being funded with drug money, specifically opium money. And the laws, the laws are being put in place to help take the drugs, to help create the wars for the drugs, to help create the financing for the wars, and all of that. And now we're talking about the Bush family, who has put Senior into office, and Junior. Senior was the CIA director that was responsible largely for these opium deposits and these opium runs inside America. Um, he funded bin Laden and paid for him as a CIA person in order to uh, essentially train these terror groups inside Afghanistan to help fight the Russians off. These are all deep state families. You have the Bush family, the Bin Laden family, you have CIA roots, and it all dates back to drug money in the country. So let's continue watching here. There's in Afghanistan. The job of Osama's trainees was not just to fight the Russian communists, it was to run Afghanistan's multi-billion dollar opium trade. Heroin, manufactured from Afghan opium, supplied 250 to 300 billion dollars annually to Wall Street and the U.S. banks. Authors Alfred McCoy and Michael Levine tied the CIA to this unholy drug alliance and received national attention when the CIA tried to suppress their books. Michael Levine became a best-selling author when he wrote about his experience of this unholy alliance. After 30 years distinguished service with the DEA, he could write with some authority. You could look at what they did to me in, uh, as a, uh, an example in microcosm of Central Intelligence's actions in the State Department in uh, completely subverting the drug war. You know, the drug war was something that only existed in the minds of Americans, on the streets of America, for kids like my brother, for cops who died. There, there was no drug war. The biggest drug dealers in the world were given a license to sell drugs to Americans to support themselves. And this continued right down from Southeast Asia, through the Mujahideen, through the Contras. So think about that now. The CIA, Bush family, compensate the opium. They create the deals that allow the opium to be sold to American pharmaceutical companies for tens of millions and billions of dollars. And this is something that is essentially happening and created by the, the Bush CIA drug war subversion. Okay. What was the heroin smuggled into the United States? One of America's most gruesome secrets is that during the Vietnam War, heroin was smuggled into the United States by hiding it inside the body bags of dead American soldiers. By the end of the 1960s, one-third of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam and close to one million United States citizens were hooked on heroin. Drugs like LSD, mescaline, marijuana, and hashish also swamped the streets and college campuses of America. Who or what turned America's youth onto these illegal drugs? Celebrity anti-war activists like Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, and Bertrand Russell sold America's youth on acid rock, tripping out, and one world government. Their financing came from the Warburg Banksters and IPS, Institute for Policy Studies. Over 100 million doses of LSD that hit the streets of America were purchased by Timothy Leary and Alan Dulles through S.G. Warburg's Sandoz AB Pharmaceutical Company in Switzerland. 
Free sample size packages of acid were handed out not only on college campuses, but at rock concerts where musicians persuaded millions of fans to get high. Critics of the drug culture blame parents, teachers, law enforcement, and everybody except the people behind it all, namely the Rothschild Warburg Banksters and their Committee of 300. According to Dr. John Coleman, who wrote the story of the Committee of 300, the Beatles rock group were brought to America by the Tavistock Institute. Tavistock launched the drug culture revolution in America to popularize and normalize social drug use. Through their record companies and advertising monopolies... Now we're talking about the Beatles being brought to America to subvert a drug culture using their music to literally influence the youth into massive drug use. Okay, this is a form of subversion. It's one of the very first times we have the music industry going and beginning to um, manipulate the population, specifically the youth. The banksters had packaged and financed their celebrity salesmen to anesthetize, addict, and enslave billions of people worldwide with dependencies on both prescription and non-prescription, legal and illegal drugs. Those drugs range from alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine to Prozac, crack cocaine, and heroin. Like the phony war on terrorism, the phony war on drugs is a cat and mouse game being fought with one hand and fed with the other. My name is Kelly Brannigan and I am an Eagles super fan. I'm Danielle Risha of Wakefield, Massachusetts. Who cares? Don't watch football. Fed with the other. The peace symbol adopted by the drug flower children of the 60s was designed by Gerald Holtham, who was commissioned by One World Government salesman Bertrand Russell. The symbol was never designed as a symbol of peace, but as a symbol of death. It is actually a cross turned upside down with the arms broken and is used by Satanists and in Druid witchcraft. In Germany, the symbol is known as the death rune and is found on tombstones of Hitler's Nazi SS officers. Okay, so think about that now. We have the 60s and 70s, which were all about the, yo, peace, the peace symbol. You've seen it everywhere. When, in fact, the peace symbol is another symbol of the drug culture, the drug subversion of the youth. Um, and it's literally beginning this satan satanic symbol into our, our youth. And, in fact, many people are starting to use it now as a symbol of peace. When, in fact, it was never a symbol of peace. It's always been a symbol of, uh, you know, antichrist. It's always been a symbol of Satan. And so now you got this drug culture that's being influenced by the, by the, uh, by, by the entertainment world, the music business. And to, to basically do, do drugs. Okay, so we continue to watch this. You'll see that it continues to get really bad. CIA's team of ex-Nazis and Skull and Bonesmen financed and trained Osama bin Laden, who pushed the Russians out of Afghanistan by 1989. The CIA then trained and installed the ruthless Taliban regime to run the booming opium trade. After a decade, the long friendship between America and the Taliban suddenly turned ugly. At a meeting held on December 4, 1997 at UNICAL headquarters, American oil men made a proposal to the Taliban about building a pipeline through Afghanistan. Rothschild Shell Oil and Rockefeller's Exxon Oil had invested billions in the Kazakhstan oil and gas reserves just north of Afghanistan. Now they needed a pipeline to transport it to the Persian Gulf. 
the Taliban demanded a bigger cut and turned down the proposal. Suddenly, the banksters' American-controlled media were calling the Taliban monsters, evildoers, and cruel villains who beat up on women. And the Taliban were also one of the very first terror organizations that President Jr. went after September 11th. So, you have these cartels, you're 97, they're trying to bo broker a deal in Afghanistan to put this pipeline on to make, again, the Rothafellas and, you know, these oil companies lots and lots of money. And essentially, Afghanistan says, no, we want more, more cut. And by 2001, the Trade Center drops. We're at war against terror. And the one of the very first places we hit, and still are, is Afghanistan, which happens to have a vast amount of heroin poppies. So, let's continue watching. On July 4th, 1999, President Clinton froze the Taliban's U.S. assets and bank accounts and imposed trade sanctions on Afghanistan. By February 2001, the Taliban destroyed most of Afghanistan's opium crops. In May, Secretary of State Colin Powell announced a gift of 43 million U.S. taxpayers' dollars to the Taliban. He called it a reward to the Taliban for destroying the opium crops. But members of the new George W. Bush White House knew the Taliban would use the $43 million for more sinister... Reward or ransom? It looked to me like the Afghanistan were willing to burn America's cash cow, their opium fills, instead of giving it to us for what ridiculous cost we wanted. So essentially... These presidents and Secretary of Defense decided it's a good idea to hand over $43 billion to Afghanistan as a sign of good measure, as a thank you, a reward. When in fact what it really was was a, hey, please stop burning it, we'll pay you money. Purposes. Not just not connecting the dots, but not getting the dots. Why was it that CIA was unable to collect information for years uh, inside Afghanistan? When they had authority to kill bin Laden for over two and a half years, why were they unable to kill him or his lieutenants? Why didn't they have a better capability to do something about it at the source? Could it be? Could it be because he's personal friends with the sit-in president and when the shot was there and they had the authority to take it, the sit-in president said no because nobody wants to shoot your friend. Nobody wants to shoot the guy you consider a brother. Okay, think of that. That the bankster supported U.S. administration is controlling both sides of the war on terror? George Bush Jr. attacked the poverty-stricken, war-ravaged country of Afghanistan only four weeks after 9-1-1. The U.S. and British military dropped 12,000 bombs on thousands of buildings and homes, pounding them into dust and rubble and killing 8,000 Afghan people. 20,000 more people died from war-related cold, starvation, and disease. Nobody made a big-budget TV production out of the massacre, with a God Bless Afghanistan movie score. The U.S.-British war on Afghanistan left behind millions of starving people and thousands of women who are still veiled, still homeless, and still penniless. Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium and now the world's largest producer of heroin. زراعت تبا سوی شفاخانی تبا سوی تجارت تبا سوی تعلیمی اداری تبا سوی مکتبون تبا سوی سرکون تبا دی و لگا دا فقر دا خلق بلشارن لری چوی 
There can never be peace and democracy in Afghanistan. Why? Because peace and democracy would expose and cut off corporate America's opium and heroin trade at the source. So what was the payoff for the U.S.-British war on Afghanistan? One, the uncooperative Taliban warlords got kicked out and replaced by the cooperative Northern Alliance warlords. Two, opium and heroin production and revenue skyrocketed. Three, Afghanistan got a new leader named Hamid Karzai, who just happens to be an ex-employee of Unical Oil. Three, America got permission to build their oil and gas pipeline through Afghanistan. In the 1980s, the United States supported Iraq's invasion of its neighbor, Iran, to stop the spread of Iraq. All right, so now, in a full circle way, Afghanistan's under new leadership, which happens to be someone who's in bed with Exxon. Their deal gets passed through. I mean, come on, guys. This is all linked together. This is all one big subversion. And it's not about a Republican or a Democrat because we're talking years of politics. We're talking Bush Jr., a Republican, maybe even before him. You, maybe you even want to put in Reagan, Carter, who knows? But let's just go to Senior. You got Senior. He's involved in this video. Senior's involved. You got Clinton, who's involved. You got Junior, who's involved. You got Obama, who's going to be involved. Because those war-stricken, poverty-stricken, refugee-stricken areas are the reason Obama used to bring them here. So remember that. There's millions and millions and millions of refugees in America right now because of the war we created in Afghanistan and other areas in order to mass produce their opiums, their heroin, into our pharmaceuticals. And it goes full circle. This is the exact reason why they don't want to medically, or why they don't want to allow marijuana to be legal in America because marijuana can fight off some of the same things that those pharmaceutical companies are making billions off of. And marijuana can be grown in your own home. So these same deep state politicians, the swamp, is going to do everything they can to protect their cash cow. The pharmaceutical companies, the, 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 uh, the opium fields in other countries, they'll go to war for drugs and to push their drugs, to make their billions. These are all things that have the American population have turned an eye to, almost been blind to. We've been subverted every step of the way. We as Americans need to be more vigilant. We need to be more awake. We need to realize that the skull and bones has indoctored every president we've had except President Trump. We have to realize that every president we've had has been related except President Trump. We have to realize that there have been deep state politics this entire time dating back before this country was founded by the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, all before this country was founded. So, when, when we get a president that says he's draining the swamp, the reason why it seems so unrealistic and so hard is because the swamp is lathered with literally in America's entire history so, in order to drain the swamp, truly drain the swamp, we would have to go back to square one and we would have to start ripping down some of these foundations and some of these uh, entities that have literally screwed the American people or converted them or subverted them or submitted them. So, be wise. Think about where your pharmaceutical drugs are coming from. Think about why they don't want you to have marijuana. Think about why 
they're pushing certain candidates as hard as they are. Think about why they're going after one thing and not something else. Think about why they don't want America to succeed. Think about why they don't want Americans to succeed. And it's simple. Because they are protecting their own interests. So, wake up America. Hold your, hold your candidates, your politicians. Hold them responsible. Question them. And I'll tell you, as Oregon's next governor, feel free to question me anytime. Because my hands are clean, they will always be clean. I will always represent the American people. And I will not sell the American people out for illegal votes. Or votes of refugees. Or laws that literally handcuff Oregonians or Americans. Thank you for watching. If you live in Oregon, help me redeem Oregon. Vote for Duncan as Oregon's next governor 2018. Help share this message. Push it. Share it to everybody you know. And if you don't live in Oregon, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Hit that bell for notifications. Um, feel free to comment in the box. But most, most important, share these videos. Share this video. If you like what I'm saying, help me fix and redeem Oregon. And maybe when we're done redeeming Oregon, we can see just how far that'll go to making America great again. So thank you for watching. Have a great day. God bless. And peace. Duncan out.